Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are. And welcome to CCL's Sunday seminar on the conservative climate pillars. I hope you had a great time at the conference yesterday and welcome back to this chance to take a deeper dive uh, into finding out what the conservative climate pillars are and the program and how we can be effective there. It is really an honor and a pleasure to introduce Rich Powell, the CEO of ClearPath and ClearPath Action. And Rich, it's great to see you again. You know, when I first met Rich earlier this year, I told him that every time I was part of a CCL lobby team meeting with a certain Republican member of Congress, the Rich's name and ClearPath would come up, as in, have you talked to ClearPath about this? So finally, I could say, I've met you, Rich. And it's no wonder that the congressman kept bringing up ClearPath. Rich and his staff have been working hard to bring conservatives to the climate, to the table on climate change and to support their policy development. As part of his ongoing work with the Conservative Climate Foundation, he played a major role in bringing a congressional delegation of six Republican members of Congress to the United Nations Climate Conference last month. And he's the perfect person to be here today to brief us on the conservative climate action pillars that House Republicans will be supporting to make the energy sector cleaner and more reliable while making our economy stronger. And as someone who spends a lot of time talking with Republicans on the Hill, he's well suited to tell us what kinds of messages and actions will help conservatives move forward and to help us be more effective in our work. So Rich, thank you so much for taking time to be with us this morning, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much, Madeline. Thank you uh, broadly to the entire CCL team. It's just a total pleasure to be here, and it's been a wonderful partnership uh, between uh, uh, CCL and CCF, uh, the Conservative Climate Foundation, and, and with us at uh, and with us at ClearPath. Um, and, and I want to thank everybody for taking part of their Sunday afternoon to uh, to nerd out with me about energy policy um, here. Uh, this is an incredibly dedicated group of people, and I hugely admire everything that uh, the entire, you know, very, very large and broad CCL community brings into this, uh, brings into this debate. So thank you so much. Um, I thought I might spend just a little bit of time talking about uh, first, I can give a quick introduction to, to ClearPath and then the, the conservative climate pillars that uh, that we and many other organizations have helped um, House Republicans come to in the past couple of months. Uh, I thought I might talk a little bit about the philosophy that underlies those pillars, because I think that that's helpful when you all think about going and messaging and speaking and advocating for specific policies with conservative members, uh, meeting folks where they are right now. And then I thought I might talk a little bit about what comes next. So uh, what we've done to date with these pillars, and then what I hope we'll be able to do, you know, as Madeline said, bring them into the next, uh, bring them into the next uh, Congress. And so um, I'll, I'll start with all that, and then um, I'll try to get through that as quickly as possible, so that then we can have the uh, the fun part, which is actually a conversation and, uh, and and questions and answers and all that sort of stuff. So um, uh, just as a just as a just as a quick start. Uh, my organization, ClearPath, is is based in D.C. Uh, unlike uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, we are not a grassroots organization. So we're a we're a D.C. based advocacy organization. We have no broad membership, which is one of our weaknesses. Uh, we're lucky to be supported by philanthropy, but we really just focus on D.C. and occasionally uh, sometimes on states. We have a team of about 25 people. We're about eight years old. Uh, we've been working on an agenda we call conservative clean energy now for about six of those eight years, uh, and it's based on both a big white space we think we saw both in advocacy with conservatives and frankly, more broadly, advocacy in D.C., uh, and it's based on uh, some uh, gaps we think in climate advocacy broadly, places that a lot of other folks we're not focusing their time and energies, but we think are really important if we're actually going to bring down global emissions. Um, and so, so our program focuses on a number of things. We, we focus on technologies rather than broad policies. So rather than kind of top down things like mandates, for example, we focus on technology families and how we bring those up uh, and develop them more broadly, both so that we can demonstrate them here in the US so that we can deploy them enough that they get cheap and cost effective, and then ideally so we can export them around the world. And I think that actually kind of mirrors broader conservative thought on this at the moment. So we, wor we work on a number of technologies within the 
deep decarbonization power space. Uh, these are things like advanced nuclear energy, fossils with carbon capture, hydropower, long duration energy storage, advanced geothermal, things like that. Uh, then we also work on a number of technologies that can decarbonize the heavy industrial sector. So things that can decarbonize steel and concrete and petrochemicals and sort of clean hydrogen as a cross-cutting thing across all those. And lastly, we work on carbon dioxide removal technologies and what can radically bring down the cost of these things that, you know, unfortunately, uh, in the future, we're going to need a tremendous scale globally if we're going to get temperatures globally back into check. And as we think about the policies that scale each of these things up, we think about basic and applied R&D uh, to just demonstrate these in a lab scale. We think about demonstration policies that can actually uh, have the private sector working with government to show that they work at real commercial scale. We think about early deployment incentives that can get them up and running. And then we think about export policies. So things that can actually get them deployed around the world. Um, and ClearPath sort of does it all. We have a C3 organization and a, and a C4 organization. So we do both the basic policy formulation and analysis and communications. We also you know, have a team of folks that do direct lobby uh, with members. Uh, and then another organization, the ClearPath Action Fund, uh, is a is a 527 electoral effort that supports folks through um, through electoral cycles. So uh, Lisa Murkowski, for example, was the the main champion of uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski. Senator elect again, thankfully, Lisa Murkowski was the was the primary champion of the ClearPath Action Fund uh, in this uh, in this cycle. So that's us. Um, so what do we mean by the six pillars? So Madeline um, teed up. Um, this idea that House Republicans have come together for the first time with a holistic approach, with a plan about how they're going to address, and as the way they framed it, energy, climate, and conservation. And so just a quick background on this before I dive into them, just so folks get a sense, this isn't just a, a normal messaging document or something. Um, back in 2021, uh, leader Kevin McCarthy, perhaps Speaker Kevin McCarthy-to-be, uh, set up several task forces in early 2021 with the idea that he wanted when Republicans retook the House, whenever that was, um, now, you know, here in a couple of weeks, that they'd have a governing agenda to come in, that they wouldn't just have a, a high level set of ideas, that they'd have a specific set of actions. And so he set up seven task forces on a number of different topics. There's one on healthcare, for example, one on um, how to deal with competition in big tech. Um, there's one on jobs, there's one on China. Uh, but one of those seven task forces was the Energy, Climate, and Conservation Task Force. And it had the specific uh, uh, purpose in mind that it was supposed to set up a re Republican governing agenda, sort of a first hundred days agenda to guide legislation that would, as they said, return the United States to emissions to an emissions reduction trajectory. The United States was on an emissions reduction trajectory from uh, about 2005 to uh, to 2020. Um, that changed in the post COVID recovery, and now for the past two years, we've actually been in an emissions increase trajectory in the United States. So they said, first and foremost, return the United States to an emissions reduction trajectory while keeping energy affordable uh, and resilient, and improving U.S. competitiveness globally, especially relative to China and Russia. Now, a lot happened uh, between April of 2021 and today, and even July of 2022, when they rolled this thing out. And today, uh, we had, at first, a global energy uh, challenge with very high prices, especially coming out of uh, the post-COVID uh, regime. Then we had a global energy crisis brought on by the savage invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Uh, we saw the devastating impacts of foolish energy policies in places like Germany uh, that had decided to take a very, very specific approach to the energy transition, the energy vinda, as they call it, uh, which led to, which it was, I don't say led to, I'll say, I will say led to, I'll say at the very least was a major contributing factor to perhaps led to uh, the invasion, put, put them into a real position of weakness uh, relative to Russia uh, and, uh, and then sort of invited uh, some of this action. Uh, and uh, we saw continuing geopolitical tension with China um, across that across that entire period. So that was sort of the background context in which this all happened. In addition to that, obviously, there was you know much more significant even than the previous years, uh, 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 you know, uh, really negative climate impacts in the United States. I think it's becoming increasingly clear to every policymaker that something is going on and that humans have a major role to play in all of this. Um, also, also on the side of greater climate action during this time, John Curtis formed the Conservative Climate Caucus. More than 70 members joined the Conservative Climate Caucus, so it's now the second largest 
uh, Republican caucus after the Republican Study Committee. Its members are very active. Folks are talking about all of this a lot more. And then obviously in that time, we've also had significant other uh, major policy passed in the energy space, some of it bipartisan. Uh, so the bipartisan infrastructure bill was passed. It set up a major demonstration program for advanced clean energy technologies. The chips and science bill was passed. That also has significant new clean energy innovation policies. Um, so a lot also happened while this task force was set up. And so I just wanted, thought I would give that context before uh, diving deeply into this. And so I think the way that I'm going to walk through it is, is I'm actually going to share ClearPath's version of it. Um, we and many other organizations were, were deeply involved in this. And so I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen, which shows you our version of it. And I'm going to do that by sharing the ClearPath Action website. So hopefully this works. Can... Can somebody give me a thumbs up? Can folks see this website? It looks great. Okay, terrific. Do we think if I played the video at the top that the video would likely come through in the audio, or do you think that's do you think do we think that's a step too far? I think you can do it when you click on the share screen button if you have the video box checked. Let's You're comfortable see. with that. Mm -hmm. If I click on the you click share screen in the bottom left share video. Uh, they have to stop sharing first and then reshare to click that button. You know what? Let's not worry about the video. Let's just <laughs> go straight into the pillars. We'll just go straight into the pillars. The video just kind of illustrates a lot of the kind of messaging um, I've just been I've just been talking about here. But so this the six pillars uh, as they're laid out by the task force begin with innovation. Um, and so uh, it's it starts with things like driving down the cost of advanced clean energy technologies so that they're more competitive globally. And, and, and that's across the entire family of innovative clean energy. So whether you're a renewables fanatic and you wanna see wind and solar succeed, but you know that long duration energy storage and advanced transmission systems are, are essential for that, that would be encompassed in here. Advanced nuclear energy and even fusion, this is actually a beautiful picture of a tokamak fusion reactor. Um, you know That sort of stuff is in here, as is uh, the whole family of clean technologies that will grow out of the continued use of fossil fuels. So this is point source carbon capture on heavy industry. This is advanced carbon capture systems on fossil combustion and power systems. And then this would also encompass things like blue hydrogen. So that's clean hydrogen made from continued use of natural gas. So that's sort of everything under this first pillar and the innovation pillar. The second pillar has to do with permitting. Um, so the tragic reality today, especially after the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, the number one impediment now to building new clean energy is the United States government and the regional transmission organizations that run transmission build across the country and state and local permitting policies. That is what is primarily holding back clean energy build today across the country. There's really no other excuse today at this point. There are massive subsidies now behind every family of clean energy technologies. And just as one example, there are more wind and solar projects caught up in the interconnect queues in the regional transmission organization, regional transmission organization queues around the country today than there is a total US power grid today. So there's, there's more than one terawatt of these projects caught up in transmission queues. Many of them have been waiting in those queues for years. The entire US electrical grid only has 1.1 terawatts of generation on it today. So it's this, this, this broken policy system that's not allowing the underlying transmission to be built that would enable these projects and then allowing these projects to be cited in places around the country that's actually the primary thing um, holding back a lot of these things today. There are other problems both at the state and local level, level and then at the federal level with the application, administration, and adjudication of the National Environmental Policy Act, or, or NEPA, and this pillar is all about reforming um, those, those different areas. The third pillar uh, is about competitiveness. So the way that we have framed it here on the ClearPath website is bring American industry back. Uh, the, the language that the House Republican Energy Climate and Conservation Task Force used was a little bit more direct. Uh, it was beat China and Russia. Um, but so this pillar is about both domestic policies that make our um, economy a more welcoming place to, to build, especially to build heavy industry, which we just empirically, categorically do in a lower emission way uh, than is done around the rest of the world. Uh, and this is also about trade policies and making sure that our exports to the rest of the world are as competitive as they possibly can be so that we can be doing everything we can to export American clean energy technologies 
in American clean and lower carbon commodities. So think lower carbon agricultural products coming out of the United States um, that can then help go and decarbonize portions of, uh, of uh, consumption in the rest of the world. The fourth pillar is unleash American resource independence. So this one is all about doing much more with the unbelievable abundance of domestic resources we have here in the US. Uh, this includes everything from increased use of domestic critical minerals and extraction of critical minerals and, and crucially the processing of those minerals here in the United States. And that's for everything from components for renewable energy generation technologies to electric vehicle technologies uh, to you know, advanced nuclear energy and, and all the other sorts of things. This is things like using American fuels more effectively. Uh, those could be things like wind and solar. Those could be things like uranium for nuclear energy. Those could be like continued use of fossil fuels as long as it's done with carbon capture attached to it. Um, and last, it's it's simple things like using our hydropower more effectively. We have tens of thousands of non-powered dams around the country, for example. We should either tear down those dams and improve the conservation uh, situation in those places, or in the places where it makes sense, we should at least power those dams, um, with the, the large ones where it makes sense, uh, so that we can be getting the hydropower out of that uh, if we already have the conservation challenges around, uh, around the dams. Um, so those first four pillars you can think of as sort of the you know, the energy, the direct energy and emissions related pillars, things having to do with industry. The last two pillars are a little different. The first is resilience. Um, and so this is uh, all around adaptation and resilience, especially pre and post disaster planning and response resilience. Um, Congressman Garrett Graves was the one who ran this overall task force. Uh, he also runs the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis for House Republicans. Um, if you don't know Congressman Graves, uh, he's from southern Louisiana. Uh, his district is one of the most exposed districts in the entire country, both to annual hurricane activity and, uh, and also just to the perennial issue of land loss, right? So southern Louisiana, for a variety of reasons, a combination of sea level rise and poor management of the Mississippi River, River and uh, uh, poor treatment of the Louisiana coastal zones um, and, and many other things is losing tremendous amounts of land. Literally, the, the boot of Louisiana is no longer really a boot. It looks like uh, something that's kind of being hollowed out, almost like Swiss cheese. Um, and so Congressman Graves is very teed up um, on this pillar and has been spending um, a lot of time on, on building out uh, policy around uh, adaptation and resilience. Um, and lastly, there's a natural climate solutions pillar. So this is everything from, um, you know, think uh, uh, innovation in precision agriculture to make our uh, agriculture lower emissions um, and, and less uh, resource intensive and more resource productive in the first place uh, to the huge carbon sequestration potential from American farms, crops, soils, uh, and forests if they were uh, used and accounted for in a better way. And if we had an accounting system, for example, the accounting system that's envisioned in the Growing Climate Solutions Act. Um, and then this is also the more advanced natural solutions uh, techniques, which are being considered both for carbon dioxide removal and for uh, reducing emissions of other climate pollutants like methane uh, and, uh, and, and NOx, which is a result of some overuse of uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers. So that kind of gives you the broad scope of these six pillars. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about each of them, please feel free to visit the Clear Path Action website. And you can also click into uh, each of the pillars where we have some high level messaging and some specific solutions uh, for each of these. And I can also share in the chat at the end of this the, the way that the pillars have been shown in um, uh, in, in the House Republican um, team's plan. So Leader McCarthy has published all this as they rolled this out uh, last year. Uh, but you can see that this covers a lot of ground, right? This is not you know, an entirely comprehensive approach to reducing U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but it does cover a lot of ground. And I think it represents a lot of what, uh, of what makes up um, Republican governing um, philosophy. Of, of how to deal with climate and clean energy. And so I thought I might just, you know, switch into that for a second and, and say a word about, um, about what I think is kind of behind this, the way that House Republicans have been approaching this, sort of what their big guiding principles are, uh, and then how we might all go forward and, and use all of this. You know, before I do that, though, I just, I want to pause for a second here, um, Madeline and, and, and CCL team, should, should I keep going and discuss that? Should I pause and 
and take questions. I see some questions are starting to come in on the chat and maybe others are in the Q&A. Um, sh should I keep going um, or, sh or should I pause for uh, for some discussion on, you know, on, on what uh, I just went through? Um, Bill or Don, are there questions in the chat that, that relate to the pillars that you would pick out? Uh, I think it, I think at this point a lot of it is is kind of more general. It does touch on some of these, but I, I think it makes sense for us to keep going. Sounds great. Yeah. Uh, well, great. Well, so I'll I'll just kind of go through at a high level a couple of the principles that I see is behind this next. Um, so first and for, foremost, conservative approaches to clean energy and climate that have then showed up in. Uh, the, the various policy platforms, for example, of the George W. Bush administration, to, frankly, of the, of the you know, uh, George H. W. Bush administration uh, before, and a lot of the, uh, the policy that showed up here in the pillars is really based on trying to, to grapple with, with climate change as a global challenge, right? So, you know, the reality is the United States obviously shares um, a huge amount of the historic emissions and an even larger share of historic emissions per capita. Uh, but going forward, most of the emissions that will drive our increases in temperature into uh, two degrees, and hopefully not, but perhaps beyond two degrees, uh, are, are going to be coming from the rapidly developing world. So there are emissions yet to come. The United States used to make up uh, at one point, I think almost as much as 50% of global emissions in the in sort of the you know economically devastated post post Second World War. We are now down to south of 15% of global emissions. Uh, China is more than double our emissions. China is now more than the U.S. and EU combined. And 95% of the emissions over the next 30 years will actually come from, 95% of the growth of emissions over the next 30 years will actually come from the rapidly developing world. Now, that's often been used as a shield for inaction, right? That's often been used as a way to support kind of a, a climate nihilism, if you will, right? Like, well, what are we going to do, right? The, you know, we can't control what Nigeria and Indonesia do. So uh, why even try? Let's just all focus on economic growth and get rich enough that we can adapt to climate change, right? That, that has sometimes been used for that. Um, we also, and I think many, many conservative climate policymakers also don't agree with that sentiment, right? They see the climate impacts are real and getting worse, but they take, take things on very, very realistically and pragmatically. So I think with a lot of liberal and progressive policymakers, what you've seen historically is the argument that, well, we need to show moral leadership first in the United States. And if we reduce emissions rapidly in the United States ourselves, regardless of what that does to our economic competitiveness, regardless of whether that slows down our economy, regardless even if that means that energy prices are so high in the United States that it pushes some manufacturing to higher emissions jurisdictions, which is in large part what happened with the EU when it sort of rapidly put in place its emissions trading system without thinking about guardrails that preserved a lot of their domestic manufacturing. And a lot of that manufacturing moved to higher emissions jurisdictions. So Climate Works and others have studied this intensively. And it's it is unfortunately possible that it may have had a, a greater than uh, a greater carbon positive impact than it had a negative impact on its on its domestic reduction. So conservatives look at that sort of moral leadership argument and, and frankly think that that is hopelessly naive. Right, just as just as the policy of uh, 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 engagement um, with uh, with China through much of the Obama administration, uh, where they became increasingly aggressive, and we became um, you know sort of uh, uh, you know increasingly concessionary with China through that period, was hopelessly naive. Just as Germany's energy transition policy, where they thought that they would take on you know an ever greater share of uh, Russian gas to aid their energy transition as they shut down their nuclear plants and some of their coal plants was again, hopelessly naive. So Republicans look at all of that and say, well, we actually need a plan that realistically drives down the cost of so many clean energy technologies that everyone around the world will adopt this stuff regardless of it being clean because it's so much more cost-effective and better performing than what's coming before. And they have, arguing for them in that the reality of the shale gas revolution, right? No one saw the, well, I shouldn't say that. The U.S. Department of Energy saw the shale gas revolution happening, but the climate modelers certainly didn't, right? Folks may recall that the clean power plan uh, set up in 2015 envisioned a 30% reduction in U.S. power sector emissions on a 2005 baseline by 2030. We accomplished a 40% reduction on a 2005 baseline by 2019 because of the shale gas revolution. 
which delivered about two thirds of all the emissions reductions in the United States. That had really very little to do with gas fired power plants being cleaner than the coal fired power plants they were replacing. They were cheaper and they were higher performing and they worked really nicely ramping up and down quickly behind renewables. And we had an unbelievable quantity of cheap shale gas because of the fracking revolution. And so that's the sort of thing that conservatives look at and say, well, why can't we do more of those sorts of things? Why, why, does, why does a clean energy technology have to be uh, higher cost or worse performing than a traditional energy technology? Why can't we find the advanced nuclear reactor or the ultra hot geothermal system or the fossil combustion system with zero emissions that not only is cleaner than what it's displacing, but that is actually cheaper and better performing? And why can't we export that around the world. That's something that we can actually imagine Indonesians and Nigerians and Indians and many, many other folks adopting to really change the trajectory uh, in, uh, you know, in their countries. So I think that's the, that's the first principle, this kind of global emissions perspective first, global emissions first. Uh, the second perspective is really a focus on emissions and performance and not on technologies. And so I think something that drives conservatives crazy when they hear a lot of the sentiment coming out of progressive policymakers is the constant emphasis on ending fossil fuels. And they know that ending fossil fuels is about a lot more than climate change to many of those policymakers, right? Folks should remember there have been calls to end the use of fossil fuels from long before the time that there was significant um, concern about climate change, right? So the original push for renewable energy, for example, had a lot more to do with sort of soft energy pathways, increasing energy costs, focusing on energy efficiency, limiting human development, limiting the expansion of human industrial activity as a means to conserve the natural world, right? There was a whole, you know, uh, uh, thought process around that pathway kind of pioneered by the Rocky Mountain Institute, for example, uh, in, the, in the 60s and the 70s. And so conservatives have been fighting a fight about this from long before anyone was really talking significantly about CO2. And, and they're driven crazy when they hear we'll end fossil fuels as opposed to end the emissions from fossil fuels, right? Because if what we really care about is climate change and reducing global emissions, it really shouldn't matter if we're using fossil fuels or not, so long as the emissions are going down year on year and we've got a realistic pathway to get to net zero um, somewhat affordably. Um, I see a comment going in there on natural gas. We should definitely talk about upstream emissions as well. Uh, clearly there's been a lot of focus on CO2 and less focus on methane. And, and, and there, there is a growing awareness that we need to uh, control the upstream methane problem in addition to the downstream carbon problem from the, uh, from, from the combustion of the fuels. The last thing I'll say about all this, and it's kind of related to this issue about um, uh, it's the emissions, not, not the fossil fuels. Uh, conservatives are, are deeply technology inclusive when they talk about um, clean energy technologies. And I say inclusive as opposed to technology neutral, because th those really do mean two very different things. I think conservatives often, when they hear clean, they hear code in their mind for renewables, and then that's, for many folks, only wind and solar, which, again, drives many policymakers crazy. Um, so in our view, it's often much better when, when talking with conservative policymakers and engaging with folks thinking deeply about this, not just to say technology inclusive, but then to say what you mean by technology inclusive and rattle off all the things that you think are in scope for a clean energy transition. For example, it's very important to many conservative policymakers that you, you unambiguously say, I am for nuclear energy. I'm for the existing nuclear fleet. I'm for expansions of the existing nuclear fleet. I'm for advanced nuclear technologies. I want to see those exported around the world. Same with things like hydropower, for example. When they say, I'm all of the above, in most cases, they really mean I'm for all of the above. Like they're really for all of the technologies. And I think sometimes it's important to sort of, you know, code for them when you're talking to them that to actually say, oh, I, I yes, I, I specifically mean I'm for this alongside all these other things. And I'm for the continued use of fossil fuels as long as we can get the emissions under control. So I think those are a lot of the perspectives that are coming from and underlying this set of policy principles and this way of thinking about all this. Um, and then, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about how we're, how we're using these and deploying these. And I'll talk first about what we've just done uh, in partnership with CCL uh, and then what we'll do Going into uh, going into the next year, um, so what we've just done. Um, so it was very important in our view that we find platforms for conservative policymakers to bring these principles out to the broader world, so that they had an opportunity to actually, you know, test their ability to message them, uh, and so that the broader world understands that they're bringing constructive solutions to the table. 
Uh, one of the big global platforms for bringing climate solutions to the table is, of course, the United Nations Climate Conferences. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with this or haven't been following this, and I suspect that's very, very few people um, like all of the uh, the climate nerds here on this call. But but for those of you who aren't familiar with this, uh, every year the United Nations, uh, since uh, since we first signed at the Rio Earth Summit, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, back in 1992 and ratified that in the United States, uh, there's been a convening called the Conference of the Parties to the UNFCCC. So that's the COP. And it's basically the global convening of the, the global community and all the signatories to this agreement to take stock of progress on reducing global emissions, and then often to uh, ag agree on uh, subsequent things like this. So this has been things like the Kyoto Protocol and then more recently the Paris Agreement um, to more specifically take action to reduce emissions. Um, and so this was COP28 uh, in Egypt this last year and an organization that uh, ClearPath helped found the Conservative Climate Foundation uh, with our friends at Crest Forum, Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions Forum, in which I am delighted to say uh, CCL is also a, uh, a uh, um, I'm now forgetting the, uh, the title, a, a, uh, a top level supporter of uh, and participant in um, alongside uh, ClearPath and Crest have now brought delegations of U.S. Republican House members and senior Republican staff both to last year's COP in Glasgow and to this year's COP in Egypt. Last year in Glasgow, our story was, we're here, we're listening, we wanna learn more about solutions. Uh, it was mostly kind of an intake of information. We had a fantastic delegation even last year. So we had Garrett Graves, the person who ran this task force. We had John Curtis, who's the chair of the uh, Conservative Climate Caucus. Uh, we had Dan Crenshaw, member from Texas, member of the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee and very, very vocal uh, young member amongst conservatives. Uh, conservative uh, House members. And finally, we had Marionette Miller-Meeks, uh, who was the most junior tenured of all those folks. She was uh, seven, or uh, at that point, 11 months out of being a state senator in Iowa, suddenly kind of on a global stage. She won her first election by six total votes, um, and but she was just sort of coming into the space. And as a member from Iowa, there's so much clean energy action and uh, an emphasis in Iowa that it made a lot of sense for her to dive deep, more deeply into this. This year in Egypt, we brought those same four members back. Uh, and I'm happy to say that for uh, for Ms. Miller-Meeks, her six vote majority the first time turned into a 6.66% majority for her reelect. Um, and by the way, it's interesting, uh, every uh, incumbent member of the Conservative Climate Caucus won their reelects um, this this cycle, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't the big wave that many of us thought was coming for House Republicans. So that's actually meaningful to say that, you know, not one member who, um, uh, was uh, you know was still you know uh, both a moderate member and uh, uh, and not uh, active on the climate issue um, uh, you know uh, didn't win their uh, their general election reelect I should say primaries unfortunately were a different story um, but so these six members uh, came they presented at the U.S. Pavilion um, the the six pillar plan uh, that they had this is the first time that a group of House Republicans has come and had a uh, sort of a conservative perspective on all this. And then, you know, they they hosted a discussion uh, on the elements of that plan and, and, and why they see that approach as, as the right one to reduce global emissions while, you know, increasing American competitiveness and why it's the right thing both for environmental stability and for the political stability of an energy transition. Uh, and it went reasonably well. We got reasonably good press coverage coming out of it all. And I think that that provided some good cover now going into next year for many of those policymakers to actually translate a lot of those ideas into policy. So just the last thing I'll say on this, what we're going to do next year, uh, and what House Republicans have said they're going to do next year, is they're going to take those six pillars and use those as the, the governing framework and inputs that will go into early uh, legislation in the first 100 days. And so there's been a lot of discussion of uh, you know, the, the, the number of bills and the priority of bills is always the order in which they come out. So HR1 will be House Bill 1. That will be kind of the, you know, a major bill that comes out. Everything between HR1 and HR5 will be a very important bill for House Republicans. So I think somewhere between HR1 and HR5 will be an energy, conservation, and climate bill that covers all of these topics, that covers innovation, permitting reform, uh, unleashing, a, uh, you know, domestic resources, uh, increasing competitiveness, increasing resilience. They now have a lot of ideas on the shelf ready to go into one of those pieces of legislation. 
those early pieces of legislation, if I'm honest, are always messaging legislation, as was, you know, the first piece of clean energy and climate legislation that Democrats introduced uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the last House term. But it is a way to sort of get those things out and then tee up a series of constructive hearings about those pieces of legislation to really explore pieces of them, to bring in experts, to bring in folks from the administration to comment on different pieces of them that would affect administration activity. Um, and it'll be a good way to start the conversation. Um, and then, you know, going as we are into a divided Congress uh, and, and a very, very closely divided Senate where, uh, you know, Senator uh, Manchin is likely to uh, still be playing a, a primary role as the chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the next Congress. Um, it's certainly my hope and our organization's hope that there'll be a lot of space for bipartisan deal making on this sort of thing going forward. I think a primary place they'll be deal making is the permitting reform conversation. And I'm delighted to hear that that's a space that CCL has started to prioritize as part of a portfolio uh, of initiatives for the organization. I'm very skeptical that we get a deal here in the lame duck on permitting reform. Anything is possible. And Senator Manchin is still trying to get his permitting reform deal done, but I think it probably will go to uh, the next Congress. And so then you're likely to see some kind of a proposal come out of the House on this, some kind of a proposal come out of the Senate, um, and perhaps, you know, wonder of wonders what we're actually supposed to do, a regular order debate where we actually have legislative hearings and get a lot of feedback and make a lot of amendments and send things to a conference process and get a deal that nobody is absolutely thrilled about, but that everybody can deal with uh, and live with and, and, uh, and is actually politically sustainable. So that's what we hope will happen, you know, as a result of all this. Um, I think I'm going to cut it off there because I see a lot of things coming in through the chat and maybe some more through the Q&A. And I've, I've talked a lot, uh, but I just wanted to say one more time, a huge thank you to, uh, to, to the entire CCL team here for, for having me and for y'all's partnership, both on CCF and, and more broadly in the space. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, I, I think it's just been outstanding that we've been able to make these connections and find these places for uh, where we can work together on moving things forward bipartisanly. Don, what do you what do you want to pick out? There's a ton of stuff now in the chat. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, Rich, this has been absolutely fantastic. I love it. Uh, I'm going to start with the, the classic CCL question, which is, uh, how do you feel about carbon fee and dividend? Where do you see carbon pricing as uh, in relation to ClearPath? I had no idea I'd be asked this question here at a CCL, <laughs> at a CCL event. Um, <laughs> So uh, uh, I'll, I, I will just be direct on this. So, uh, so uh, car, uh, carbon fee and dividend has not been a policy that ClearPath has prioritized uh, in, in the past six years. Um, there are a variety of reasons for that. Um, first and foremost, we share this very global perspective on, uh, on emissions reduction. And so in our view, the most important thing is driving down the cost of these technologies at home and doing that as quickly as possible. And so when we kind of prioritize different policies that we go after, we look at the things, well, what's, the, what's a rapid way to, to drive down the cost of, for example, advanced nuclear energy? And if you've got one pool of political capital, capital in any given Congress to do something like that, it has seemed to us that just the technologies that directly rapidly drive down the cost of advanced nuclear energy, so things like uh, demonstration programs at DOE, early deployment incentives to get those things stood up and running, regulatory reform, uh, are the things that actually can do that and then you know focus on, on getting the things exported. I do not dispute that in the long term, a carbon fee in the United States would, wouldn't also do that. But if we're focused on very, very rapidly doing this, a carbon fee would probably do that for advanced nuclear energy in the 2040s, because the, the, it's a technology that's kind of needed to decarbonize the last 20% of the US power sector. And the efficient way that a carbon price would drive out those reductions would, would sort of end up deploying that sort of a decade or two from now. Um, our view is that if that's not ready for global deployment in the mid uh, in the, you know, by the late 2020s, early 2030s, we'll have missed a big opportunity for a lot of global decarbonization. And so we prioritize it for that. And then, you know, on the on the other side, we just kind of look at our pool of political capital and what a group like ours can achieve, who's really a DC focused without a major grassroots organization, without the ability like y'all to go and be in every district talking to so many different members. And, you know, as you know, carbon fee dividend is very, 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 politically difficult. Uh, and so uh, given that difficulty and given sort of our priority on the global front, um, we, you know, we've just decided to, uh, you know, to prioritize sort of the more innovation focused technologies. 
It makes a lot of sense. I like the the faster. That, I, I think that, <laughs> that's really good. Um, I do uh, another question kind of in that same vein. Uh, how do you see like carbon border adjustments kind of fitting into your policy stance, um, kind of especially given the context of Europe uh, implementing their their carbon yeah, pricing scheme? Totally. Uh, it's a great question. And I, I think that this is something that's that's a lot more feasible politically than, than domestic uh, carbon prices. Uh, just so a couple of things on this. One, the, um, the the task force pillars I just mentioned, there is a pillar, as I mentioned, it, there's a competitiveness pillar. There's a beat China and Russia pillar. That pillar today from House Republicans doesn't say anything explicit about carbon border adjustments, but it also doesn't rule it out. Uh, and that was intentional, right? Because folks aren't sure exactly where the politics of that issue goes. Uh, it's become more challenging, obviously, given inflation. Right. Um, but broadly, at its core, that issue is one that has a lot of support, including from a lot of conservatives. A lot of the sort of the America first trade crowd from the previous administration is quite supportive uh, of this issue. So folks like Bob Lighthizer um, and former National Security Advisor McMaster, Dave Banks, who ran a lot of this portfolio of both the National Security Council and the National Economic Council, was kind of like the Republican climate czar, the Republican John Kerry in the beginning of the last administration, all very, very supportive of this. Paul Ryan, interestingly, just came out strongly supportive of carbon border adjustments, um, just in you know some thought leadership he did at AEI uh, in the past couple of months. So, so there's significant support out there for it. Um, and I think that there, you know, the, the, the reality, just as you know, is the EU is going to move forward with this, right? Obviously, I think Ukraine has pushed that back a couple of years, but their climate concern is unabated. And they're going to come out of this situation even less dependent on coal and gas than they were going into this situation. So, you know, arguably with a cleaner economy long term than they went into it. Uh, and so they're going to really, really, really want to protect the domestic industry, which is taken a battering uh, during this war and this period of hyper energy crisis, crisis for them. So, so, so they're going to be on this. And, and the question for the U.S. isn't should we do a, a carbon border adjustment or not. The question for the U.S. is going to be how do we respond to the European CBAM? Do we respond in an aggressive way and effectively launch into a trade war with Europe right alongside our trade war with China? Doesn't seem like fun. Uh, or do we try to do something together, right? Either together directly with our European allies or more broadly through the OECD. Um, I also see a lot of hope for the sectoral approaches. You know, as a good conservative, I'm an incrementalist. I like to see things done bottom up, tested in individual sectors, then rolled out more broadly. We already now have an agreement, a US-EU agreement on clean steel and aluminum. And part of that is meant to be joint measures to bring down our respective industries and collectively improve the emissions profile. And so I think that will be a really interesting test case. Like, can we get something on this working in two crucial high emitting energy intensive trade exposed sectors that both parties feel good enough about that we could imagine then, okay, what's next after steel and aluminum? Do we go to petrochemicals or do we go to fertilizers or, you know, or some, some next thing? And so I think there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of potential there as well. Cool. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Um, uh, I'm more of a messaging question here. We've had a couple of uh, uh, conservative senators who have voiced concern around supporting uh, advancing our use of, of battery and solar technology because China is so dominant in that market. Um, uh, any thoughts on how you would kind of address those concerns? Um, sure. Well, you know, I'll just I'll start by saying I, I share the concerns that we ought not trade you know, a dependence on the variability of global oil markets, for example, to dependence on, you know, which has a lot to do about politics in, you know, the Middle East and Russia, uh, with a dependence on uh, entirely, you know, foreign sourced, um, you know, critical mineral supplies components, and, and crucially the processing of those supplies and components uh, to um, an even greater geopolitical competitor, that being China at the moment. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's a world in which you can imagine U.S.-China relations improving over the next decade. There, there seems to be, you know, a, a, a thaw being attempted, um, you know, with Xi taking on his uh, his third term and sort of not not needing to save a rattle quite as much. And this administration wanting to ease things because it wants to import those solar panels because it is the cheapest way to decarbonize parts of the U.S. economy right now. So you can see a lot of incentive for it. And obviously, China is very, very interested in getting more of our LNG uh, flowing into China um, and flowing out of the United States. 
um, uh, and you know don't want to be as dependent on a, on a loose cannon ally like Russia. They don't want another North Korea on their hands, and that's that's what things are headed for. North Korea with a lot more nuclear weapons than than uh, their other North Korea problem has, right? So you can see a lot of reasons that that would make sense, and you can see a lot of ways that that situation will really go sideways in the next decade, right? Like at some point, is are they going to make good on the threat to you know um, reengage Taiwan, right? And that will that will. There will be a war of some kind, right? We do not want to be in a situation where our entire passenger transportation fleet is dependent on materials coming out of this country in the middle of some kind of a serious conflict, whether that's soft or hard um, with China. So I share all those concerns. Um, I do think that there are lots of ways to overcome those concerns and still get all of the best things out of these technologies. So I think the push from things like the bipartisan infrastructure bill to bring manufacturing back into the United States and demonstrate critical minerals extraction, critical minerals processing, advanced manufacturing of vehicle components and batteries and uh, uh, advanced power electronics and renewable technologies uh, in the US makes a lot of sense. I also think that some coherent way of prioritizing the other less critical uh, points of our clean energy supply chain makes a lot of sense. We're doing that kind of implicitly in a lot of the policymaking we're doing. So for example, the, the, the emphasis, which some people look at and say, well, that doesn't make economic sense right now on advanced nuclear energy and on fossil sort of carbon capture, a big, a big part behind that is, well, you know, maybe, maybe even at their best, these things end up being more expensive on an LCOE basis, levelized cost of electricity basis, uh, than some kinds of wind and solar energy, even combined with all the costs of storage and transmission and all that. Maybe they end up being somewhat more expensive, but if it's a more expensive technology, but where we're getting a much less critical supply chain, much more of which we control domestically, that results in less um, geopolitical stress on our supply chain, maybe that's worth doing, right? It, it certainly would have made sense in a place like Germany for them not only to not shut down their nuclear reactors and backfill all that with Russian gas, but actually to continue the long, wonderful, proud tradition that Siemens and a lot of German companies had in leading on advanced nuclear energy. I mean, they would have been in a fantastically better spot than they are today uh, if they had continued to focus on that, even though some of those nuclear reactors might have been more expensive than a combination of offshore wind and Russian gas, even though those, those things had seemed you know, cheaper than that at the time. There's a lot of other hidden costs that come behind every one of our energy policymaking decisions. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think you answered three questions in that. That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to stay on the nuclear topic, um, where uh, do you see um, thorium availability as any type of limiting factor in terms of advancing our nuclear growth? Uh, that is a that's a great question. Um, so we are uh, we have not prioritized a lot of work on the thorium fuel cycle. Uh, in our work on advanced nuclear energy, uh, for, for those of you that don't that don't follow all of this, uh, there are kind of two uh, major, really well understood nuclear fuel cycles out there. The one that, that is primarily used around the world today is a uranium-based fuel cycle. There's another one uh, based in another uh, radioactive element uh, called thorium. There's all kinds of reasons that um, uh, thorium also makes sense. It's sort of a uh, you know this is like a VHS Betamax debate, uh, and it has been for for decades. Uh, the reality today globally is that we went with VHS, right? So um, even if even if the thorium fuel cycle for, for all of its benefits um, would, would make a lot of sense to sort of broadly transition to, there's so much infrastructure built up around the uranium fuel cycle today that it's a little difficult to see how you'd switch over the global nuclear industry, even the global advanced nuclear industry into that alternative fuel cycle. That all gets a little bit easier if we start relying more on advanced nuclear reactors and we stand up more recycling and reprocessing operations around the global nuclear fleet, then we become slightly less reliant on a single stream, you know, uranium-based fuel cycle. And you could imagine us introducing thorium reactors at a couple of different stages of that whole thing. So we see that as something that maybe would happen, you know, over the next couple of decades. But unfortunately, we've got some higher priority building blocks in advance of that. So we've got just demonstrating advanced non-light water reactors in the US. We're, we're, we're working on that already. The, the US Department of Energy has got a program stood up already. We're gonna have 
maybe 20 of those built uh, in the U.S. this decade. Some of them very, very small, but we'll probably have 20 new advanced reactors built in the U.S. this decade. There's also significant work standing up in sort of a debate reopening around recycling and reprocessing of nuclear fuels, which is very healthy. We all got stuck on this debate about whether to permanently store waste in Yucca Mountain uh, for the past couple of decades. Uh, it turns out nobody wants that stored in Yucca Mountain. Conservatives don't want that. Democrats don't want that. So it's not going to happen. So now we've got to figure out something else to do with that. One of the things we can do with it is recycle and reprocess it like they do in France and like they have for a long time in parts of the Japanese nuclear industry as well. So we're sort of getting into that as well. And all of that, I think, in the long term may well open or reopen the conversation about, about thorium too. The very last thing I'll say about it, I'm not even sure that this question was asked, but I'll throw it in, is, uh, you know, there's there's often a discussion about, um, you know, how much uranium do we have? Thorium is technically more abundant in more places, and so shouldn't we have this other nuclear fuel as well? Uh, the reality is actually the, the global uranium extraction industry is sort of way over um characterized uh, and, and opened up at the moment. Uh, the problem for a lot of uranium extraction opportunities, including in the United States, has been that the price of uranium is so low and it is so abundant in so many parts of the world that uh, they can't even keep mines in Wyoming open. Um, and so I actually think we've got a whole lot of opportunity in, in uranium and just um, getting that, you know, stood up and into a more, more healthy place than, than, you know, than we even have to then worry about going over to uh, uh, to, to thorium as, a, as an additional fuel. Fascinating. Um, uh, thinking about uh, transitioning to that, uh, when you opened with the need for new transmission lines and kind of the government's kind of in the way, uh, how do we look at, uh, how do we kind of formulate policy uh, that allows us to build out these transmission, build out the energy that we need, while at the same time kind of making sure we're, we're still protecting, you know, low-income folks, natural areas, you know, uh, that that originally was the design of this review process anyway? Sure. Uh, it's a great question. Um, unfortunately, it's a complex one because we do permitting of these things at at least three different levels, right? We, we have a, a whole set of federal environmental statutes so where you have to get permits to do any new project that sort of crosses state boundaries or that runs across public lands. Those, those are things that begins with the National Environmental Protection Act, but then also the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. So you have to sort of show compliance with all those statutes at the federal level. Then in the whole parts of the country that are deregulated, that just means that the locus of regulation has gone to a different place. So it's, 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 not, it's no longer at a state public utility commission. It's now at a regional transmission organization, which is made up of representatives from all the states, along with ratepayers, advocates, and utility advocates and many, many others, and you have to prove the case for your new transmission line or power plant or whatever through these RTOs. And then you have to comply with whatever your state or local laws and ordinances around this are. And so in many cases, in many counties in the United States, for example, they have either moratoria or very strong setback requirements on new build transmission or new build wind. And so a setback requirement would be something like, well, it can't be more than 2,500 feet close to a building or a road. Well, it turns out that in most of the developed United States, there's very, very little anything that is that is not within 2,500 feet of a building or a road, especially the kinds of places you'd want to build transmission. So you've got to comply with these laws or statutes or mandates or restrictions at all three of these different levels. Uh, and that is really, really tough. Uh, it's why today new build transmission is only expanding at about 1% a year in the United States. So if you're a fan of the Inflation Reduction Act and you see that driving a lot of progress, uh, the models that show the Inflation Reduction Act rapidly driving down U.S. emissions by rapidly scaling up, for example, a lot of wind and solar this decade in the U.S., they show new build transmission more than doubling every year. Uh, for at least the next decade. So going from about a 1% expansion a year to about a 2.5% expansion a year. If they don't double, if they stay at the same rate, so we just keep building transmission at this, frankly, very incremental rate, 80% of the projected emissions reductions from the IRA go away, right? If we can't rapidly build all the new transmission to do this. A lot of our transmission in this country is either quite old or totally oversubscribed and congested. So for example, Iowa has done amazing things to build new wind. Um, the UK built a lot of wind onshore. They topped that at about 10%. Germany built a lot of wind onshore. They topped that at about 30%. 
Iowa's at north of 50% of their power comes from onshore wind. It's incredibly dense wind already built today in Iowa. But as a result, the, the transmission grid in Iowa is completely congested. You cannot, effectively cannot put any more wind on the grid in Iowa until you have new transmission, either moving it across Iowa or moving it out of the state so that it can be consumed in Illinois or something like that. So it's a huge priority to get this done, but we've got to fix the permitting regimes at all three of those levels. It starts with NEPA at the federal level, which is sort of the grandparent of all the other statutes, uh, and just gives you permission, getting through NEPA just gives you permission to go and show that you can comply with the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. So that's all we're talking about with NEPA is just doing an environmental impact statement that gives you permission to go on and comply with these other things. But today, in many cases, it can take a decade or more to get an EIS for a new transmission line. We've got to radically improve the application and the administration and the adjudication of NEPA to fix that. We've got to fix at the RTO level this problem of these queues, these backed up queues where somebody is uh, applying for a new transmission line or a new solar or wind farm, and then they're not even getting permission to get onto the grid for another four years. Um, sometimes this can be done in parallel with the first stuff, with the NEPA stuff. Sometimes they have to be done in sequence. So now you're talking about 10 plus another four, not good. And then we've got to find a way to you know, bring states and counties along so that they're not putting in these really restrictive moratoria. In fact, they're often, you know, we, in many cases, we're going to need to walk these things back. New York State has done something which I think is, is, is farsighted, which is to say, this is really important for the state. We're going to have one centralized state level a policy planning and siting decision that's going to be at NYSERDA, the sort of the state energy agency and we're not going to let every single county intervene and hold back projects that maybe they don't like new jersey has taken some of the same steps i think we may need to find ways to roll that out to more states so that you don't have all these folks that are stopping every single stage of the project what's FERC's role in this so uh, FERC is the one who governs the, the, the RTOs, the regional transmission organizations. Uh, there is an effort underway, uh, well, there was an effort underway under uh, Chairman Rich Glick. Um, Rich Glick's term is now expiring, and it's unlikely that he will be extended as chairman of FERC for a variety of reasons. Even Senator Manchin um, has said that he's um, not on board with Glick being renominated. So there's a world in which they could fix some of these issues for the, that middle level of the things where they could fix the how all of this is done at the regional transmission organizations. There's more to it than that, unfortunately. There's not just the interconnect use, but there's also the where the transmission goes in the first place, who permits that transition, and then who pays for that new transmission going in. Is that just the next person going onto the grid, or is that everybody who th theoretically would share its benefits? So he had a process going, which was taking on all of those decisions it's a little unclear what's going to happen with that. There's another reform proposal to that, which is part of the bill that Senator Manchin had proposed, the permitting reform bill that Senator Manchin had proposed and struck the deal with Senator Schumer and Speaker Pelosi to get through, that he's still working on trying to get through later this year. It has a process, it has a proposal for how to do all of that and how to kind of solve the cost allocation issue, the who pays issue. Uh, but that proposal has, prov has proven um, quite controversial with a lot of folks who don't want to see more FERC authority come over their state uh, utility planning processes. So this is a this is a complex one. It's going to require a lot of different fixes in a lot of different places. Oh, man, I thought this was going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we're just, you know, the, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the any of your policies that, that incentivize or require something is just the first step of, of uh, then a really long and complex journey to actually go. <laughs> I believe it. Um, well, talking a little bit about uh, the the continued use of fossil fuels and addressing the the emissions there, uh, how how is it possible to kind of have that fossil fuel combustion without creating emissions? Oh, that's a great question. So, um, uh, and I can I'm happy to share uh, after this. There's a there's a video uh, on the ClearPath website about one of these technologies called Net Power, where we try to describe what's what what happens. But the you know the basic idea is. And this is a very well proven technology. It's been done, you know, all over the world. I think we're now doing 40 million tons a year of this. You can basically put a device on top of the smokestack um, from a power plant. That's a that's a dilute stream of gases coming out of that smokestack. So in the case of like a gas fired power plant, about 4% of what comes out of that is CO2. The other 
Uh, 96% is a mix of nitrogen and oxygen, which is what we're all breathing and a few other trace gases, some, some water vapor and stuff. You can selectively pull the CO2 out of that dilute stream of gas, just like we pull the sulfur emissions out of, out of that stream of gas, and just like we pull the NOx out of that stream of gas with all the scrubbers that we put on these plants. So these things are called carbon capture systems or you know, point source carbon capture systems that are pulling it specifically out here. Um, it's really well known how to do this. They work, they're reliable. Today, they're expensive because we've only done a couple of them on power plants. There's one running right now in Saskatchewan. There was another one running in Texas on a coal plant. It's totally understood. We've done it on gas plants. It's totally understood. Today, it's too expensive. So the only way we can make it less expensive over time is to do a lot of them and to learn by doing and to incrementally improve the technology just like we did with wind and solar. So these kind of, they're all about like, where wind was and where solar were 10 or 15 years ago, right? Seemed like really interesting technologies, really well known, too expensive for prime time on the grid. We just did a lot of them that radically brought the cost down. Uh, and we need to, you know, just do more of that. Just the one other thing I'll say about it is there's a lot more immediate promise, not for things that are bolt-ons to older plants, but are, are new build plants. So like net power, for example, the one, the, the video we have is a new build gas plant, which sort of takes this CO2 capture thing into account in the first place. It never makes the first mistake of fossil combustion, which is that you burn the fossil fuels in normal air, as opposed to pure oxygen. When you burn them in normal air, that means you have all of this nitrogen. 78% of what we're all breathing right now is nitri inert nitrogen gas, right? That means you have all this nitrogen that runs through your whole power system, your, your gas turbines, all that kind of stuff. If you never have that nitrogen in the first place, if you just burn natural gas, for example, methane, CH4, in pure oxygen to begin with, the only thing it produces is CO2 and water vapor. Right? And when you have a pure stream of CO2 with a little bit of water vapor coming out, then you don't really have to capture anything. Everything coming out of it is pure CO2. That's ready to go into a pipeline. And then, then that can be put safely underground somewhere. So we're doing that. We do uh, 10 million tons of that a year already in the United States and a couple of different sites. We just put more into those wells or make new wells to do this. Or it may even be possible to use that for products one day. So greenhouses, for example, will buy this CO2 in many cases, because it's often better to grow plants in a in a higher CO2 environment. It's literally food for the plants pulled from the air. Fascinating. Uh, where do you see the policy intersecting in terms of finance? Um, there's going to be, we're going to need a lot of capital to make these investments. So what, what do we need to see to get uh, financial institutions on board? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, First thought is that there's already a gigantic amount of, of clean finance, clean capital, right? So you kind of, you know, not, not a week goes by that another gigantic investment bank or commercial bank doesn't make a trillion dollar commitment, right, to financing the clean transition. So there's actually not a lack of capital, right? There's actually a lack of bankable projects, because for the most part, those financial institutions, they're happy to direct money to clean energy and to, you know, give their uh, energy investment bankers, a broader share of the balance sheet than their technology investment bankers, right? They're, they're happy to do that. But the, you know, the energy investment bankers still have to bring, you know, good projects to come and finance, right? That can, you know, bring, you know, broadly acceptable commercial returns. They, these banks are not charities and we shouldn't expect them to act like charities. So uh, the ways that you can do that are one, you can subsidize the project. So the federal government participates in the economics of the things and transfers some taxpayer dollars into the pockets of the financial institutions. That's what we did with wind and solar, right? So, so gigantic banks, JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citibank built huge tax equity practices, leveraging the sol the wind PTC and the solar ITC and helped you know fund hundreds of gigawatts of, of build of those two technologies over the last decade. That worked really well. The, the problem is, it's, it's difficult to subsidize things forever, right? It's, it's hard to imagine every bit of the transition actually being subsidized in that way. The IRA effectively does that, right? So, so the IRA effectively says for the power sector, we're going to do the whole thing or about 95% of the thing by the time we're done uh, via a subsidized approach. Um, that is a way to, to do it. Um, I hope that the um, all of the innovation policy we've also done drives down the cost of clean energy enough that the subsidies are not as required as they appear to be. Because I worry about the political sustainability 
of not just subsidizing this little bit, right? So all the subsidies we've currently paid out that all these people complained about as being so expensive, um, just brought wind and solar from about 1% of the power system to about 10% of the power system. If we're trying to do the, the rest of the power system, right? So if we're trying to go from, you know, now the 40% or so, we've got about, you know, 9% in hydro, another 10 or 11% in wind and solar and 20% in nuclear. If we're gonna try to go from 40% of the power system to 95% of the power system is clean, another 55%. That means another effort that's kind of like at least five times bigger than what we just did with wind and solar, which people already complained about as being really expensive. Um, and so, you know, the financial institutions will will participate in all of that effectively with cost shares from the federal government be all the subsidies that just went into them. Um, and then it's hard to imagine doing that yet again for the entire transportation system and the entire industrial system. So, so I think we really need to focus on bringing down the cost of clean energy so more of these projects are just bankable by the big financial institutions in the first place, as opposed to having to just throw this mountain of subsidies at them to get them done. Hmm. Very good. Think about just, for example, the natural gas transition was far less subsidized, right? So that wasn't, it doesn't go all the way clean, but it's half as carbon intensive as coal. We did put about $10 billion in the subsidies in that. Those ended around 2004, but it really got going at that point because it was so cheap that all of these financial institutions put all of this money, arguably too much money, into new gas extraction and into new combined cycle natural gas turbines without any subsidies behind them. But because the technology was so cheap and happened to be clean and really good performing. So if we could get to that with you know, clean transportation fuels, for example, we could do a lot of the transition without the need for all the subsidies. Aside from economies of scale, how do you see driving those costs down? Uh, well, so, uh, certainly economies of scale um, as, uh, as one big one. Uh, there's another one, which is just, you know, better technologies in, in the first place, um, right? So with uh, shale gas, for example, it wasn't just that we were doing more gas extraction, it's that we found a better mousetrap. So, so we found a way to pull out these gigantic quantities of gas from things that we thought were very marginal because they were very difficult because the bubbles were very, very small. In these, in these reserves. We found a way to, with a single well, um, turn a single well into many wells with horizontal drilling. So you could go down in one well, but then you could go out miles in every direction from one well, because suddenly you could drill horizontally. We then found a way to break up all those little tiny bubbles into larger recoverable bubbles via hydraulic fracturing. So the use of you know, water and chemicals to, to break up the rock. We found quicker ways to find all of this stuff via uh, underground 3D seismic imaging. So we didn't have to drill as many wells in the first place. Um, we found diamond-headed drill bits so that every drill we sent down would work better and faster. We didn't lose as many drill heads. And then we found combined cycle natural gas turbines. So that took the efficiency of a gas combustion process from you know, somewhere in the, the, the 30s or 40% of the gas, of the energy potential in the gas being recoverable as electricity to north of 60% of the, of the gas uh, potential um, being recoverable. So every one of those, I mean, you know, it's all a matter of degree. You could call them fundamental breakthroughs. You could call them inter incremental breakthroughs. But it was more than just economies of scale. Like each of those was a new and better technology. And that's the cool thing about combinatorial innovation. When you combine all five of those things together, suddenly you've got a radically more cost-effective way that also happens to be half the emissions, you know, to produce the same electricity. Sounds good to me. Uh, I'll what, say, I mean, just, 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 just one more I'm going to just totally nerd out here on this <laughs> thought, but, you know, folks may remember, um, you know, if you, if you're uh, flying now over Southern California, occasionally you still see Ivanpah and the few other concentrating solar power plants we built. These are the things where there's a big tower in the middle, mirrors all around, and, you know, the mirrors catch the sun's rays. They send it up effectively in like almost like laser beams of reflected light to the tower in the middle that captures that all as heat energy. And then that heat energy is stored in a, in a molten salt vat. And then that is used to eventually boil water and, uh, and create electricity from a turbine. So it's a different way to capture solar energy. It's not a uh, photovoltaic panel, which takes a photon and turns it directly into an electron. It's a way to capture solar energy with the added benefit that you can store that over time. Um, that technology never took off in the United States. It got a lot of bad press because those light beams tend to fry the birds that flies through those things. And so the Ivan Paw project, for example, got a lot of bad press. The, the New York Times turned it into a field day, you know, put on their fight promoter hat and uh, 
kind of ruined the US CSP industry. Um, that industry is actually thriving in other parts of the world. So in the Middle East and North Africa, they've really stood that up and they've fixed a lot of the problems with those things. Israel has had a better experience with CSP as well, for example. They fixed some of the bird issues. But the cool thing about all of it is that they've really figured out this molten salt energy storage thing, right? So that's been done now dozens of times. There's a well-articulated supply chain, et cetera. And now this is looking like a more promising way to store energy for more applications. You combine that with one of the advanced nuclear companies called TerraPower. This is Bill Gates' nuclear reactor. They're now planning to store the heat that comes off of that reactor first in, the molten, in a molten salt storage tank and then to use it to drive electricity. This would change a nuclear reactor, which just runs flat all the time, right? Nuclear reactors aren't very flexible. It's not like a gas plant. You don't want to bring it up and down all the time. You actually want to run it flat out. But if you're continuously heating the molten salt in the storage tank, and then as you need it on the grid, you're selectively taking off this molten salt storage thing, you can run a nuclear plant much more effectively and therefore much more uh, profitably on many grids. Mm -hmm. So you've got this really cool example where we went away from nuclear because we were interested in solar. We developed this solar technology. It cracked this thermal storage problem. And then this thermal storage technology is coming back to help advanced nuclear plants get a lot more flexible. That's really cool. And I think we're going to see all kinds of things like that that we didn't even see coming in all these clean technologies over the next couple of decades. That is really cool. Um... Where do you see the, the uh, looking into the 118th Congress, uh, where, and you mentioned the uh, kind of the first few bills that the Republicans will put forward in the House as kind of those, uh, those statement bills. Uh, what, where do you see the politics going in terms, and especially in terms of the uh, kind of the conservative climate caucus moving these types of, of policies forward in this divided Congress? Um, well, I think you, I think you can play a huge role. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, as you know, I mean, the, 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 the grass, grassroots, uh, radical moderation is not typically a, a characteristic of grassroots movements across the country, right? So we have a very strong, uh, extremely progressive grassroots movement which has a very particular, much of which, not all of which, but much of which has a very particular perspective on the energy transition. And it looks a lot like the way California and Germany have approached the energy transition, which is, uh, I think, challenging both politically and, and I think sub substantially, substantively, is, is proven very challenging for those two jurisdictions. Um, and then you have a lot of uh, folks, maybe on the far of the other side, that are either, you know, extremely conservative uh, activists or, or maybe folks that you know, work specifically in parts of the traditional fossil community, especially the, the 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 small parts of the fossil community. So not the great big companies that are all on board with the transition and putting a lot of, you know, billions of dollars of resources into this, but, a, you know, sort of the, the smaller operators that they really don't see a future for themselves if there's not a lot of gasoline sold in this country anymore. Um, so those are kind of the two folks, those two big sets of very vocal folks that policymakers are hearing from a lot they're hearing from very few folks in the radical middle that are more pragmatic, but really passionate about this and willing to come and talk to them in district and come and fly to DC and talk to them about moderate solutions. And so I think serving as that constituency, as that voice for the, you know, for the passionate moderates, willing to talk about tough things like permitting reforms and occasionally making trade-offs where we do environmental reviews faster for the sake of clean energy, right? Or where we're taking on broader technology solution sets and we're getting folks that maybe thought they were anti-nuclear 10 years ago to you know, come around on this and support policies that are at least inclusive of nuclear um, from the democratic side. That's a really powerful um, place to be. And I think a place that uh, an amazing role that CCL can continue playing. Uh, building on kind of that that space that, that we try and uh, that, that we try and hold uh, is you know how how do you see us um, continuing to foster that that bipartisanship and that type of conversation across the aisle? Um, any any tips on how how to address uh, these lawmakers? I mean, you, uh, being DC, you're you're in it every day. So um, you know, what would you like to see from a, a grassroots organization like ours? Um. 
what's well, a first and foremost keep keep doing what you're doing because i think what you're doing is is great um and uh you shouldn't break anything that's uh, or fix anything that's not broken so i think your fly-ins are very powerful and your in district engagement is really powerful i think what i always hear from folks about you is uh one that everybody's friendly and thoughtful and smart um and um and that praise means that you know a lot of the folks that you're up against are, are often not that right when they come and engage people uh two that you know ccm members always come with some actual point of engagement like here's this bill you did that i really liked and we want to thank you for uh supporting or co-sponsoring or or doing this you know on this action always finding some point of common ground so i'd say doing more of that you know as you find ways to engage folks in state or in district uh we have found that there is nothing like going and seeing something with a member so you know a visit to an office is terrific but if you can get the members to come and visit the you know uh, the new battery manufacturing um plant that's in district or, or just across just across the line or the um, you know, the, the laboratory at, at a national lab or at a university where there's some breakthrough technology, like just engaging folks in something real that they can see and see not see it not just as a policy issue, but something where it's actually employing people and somebody's wearing a hard hat. And uh, it seems like some real advance is happening. Um, that That is really, really helpful. Cool. Excellent. Well, I think that gets to be one of the things that we want to push forward in the spring, by the way, folks. Fantastic. And so, I mean, we are, uh, please, please use and abuse ClearPath in that mission. We spend a lot of time with the national laboratories. We spend a lot of time tracking these technologies. Uh, we could, we could have a great conversation about, you know, will this district, you know, who would you recommend bringing folks to, or you know, what companies here might be uh, might be interesting? I mean, you're you're in the district, so you probably. Uh, I'll take you up on that because I also have observed that we've said this for a while, and it's easier to say than to actually get it set sure. up. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, we can. Uh, uh, we've gone through most of our questions here. I think uh, we'll we can kind of end with maybe one more. Uh, Rich, what got you into this field? Um, you know, what what sparked your interest, and how did you end up kind of here at ClearPath? Um, well, I've, I've been doing this for my entire professional career, for better or for worse. I, I guess that means I've not made a lot of progress here. Um, <laughs> you know, last uh, last uh, seventeen years. Uh, so I, I majored in this stuff in college and was very passionate about climate change uh, from the early days. I, I did a, I, I explored a bunch of different ways of trying to have impact in the space um, and sort of including, you know, I, I, I worked with Arctic indigenous peoples uh, within, with Inuit communities and, uh, and, and other kind of Arctic indigenous uh, organizations and groups um, about, about raising the profile of the issue. Um, and uh, I, I tried a bunch of different things. I went to went to law school. I thought maybe I'll try environmental law. It turned out I would have been a, just a terrible lawyer. So I'm glad that that never, uh, glad that that never stuck. But uh, then I ended up in, in management consultants, uh, management consulting um, at uh, McKinsey and Company, um, which, uh, you know, has its definitely has its flaws, but uh, has a has a deep uh, sustainability and energy practice globally. And so I I got to see a lot of different organizations and approaches and business models uh, and, and philanthropic approaches and pu public policy approaches globally to all this sort of stuff. Uh, and then landed with uh, ClearPath, I've got my little logo right here, uh, as, uh, as uh, frankly, as my last client, um, and, and I never left. And so we've, we've built this now over the past uh, six years, um, sort of in the climate philanthropy and advocacy space. That's so cool. <laughs> Awesome. Well, I want to you ask your time. question too, Rich. Um, just going back to Egypt, what was one of your personal highlights uh, from having the folks together there? Um, let's see. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, first and foremost, just kind of you know being being on that stage at the U.S. Pavilion with you know with John Curtis uh, and with and with Garrett Graves. Um, and and Miller Meeks and, and and Crenshaw uh, was was pretty extraordinary. I mean, when we started this journey in uh, really in earnest in 2015, I mean that was just you know that was maybe just a year and a half after Senator Inhofe threw the snowball on the Senate floor, right? It was it was a it was a it was a tough place. It was a very contentious time, right? And it took a while to 
even get to the point where members were open and comfortable, you know, saying, you know, getting beyond, I'm not a scientist, uh, and, you know, talking broadly about climate change directly is something that was worth uh, focusing on. And to get them to the point where not only are they willing to go to the COP, but they're willing to kind of have a public constructive discussion about all this sort of stuff. Uh, and then actually later that same evening, um, uh, or maybe the, sorry, the next evening, uh, Secretary Kerry, now Special Presidential Envoy for Climate Kerry, uh, we, we, the delegation met with him that afternoon along with uh, Brian Deese from the White House and had a, uh, I'll call it a rollicking uh, constructive discussion on, uh, on clean energy and climate. Not entirely, you know, uh, it, was, it wasn't all sunshine and bunny rabbits, but it was a good discussion. It was kind of an opening of a, a dialogue. Uh, and then uh, Secretary Kerry mentioned them at a big public event that, you know, that night and was, I think, you know, uh, put out a little bit of an olive branch to conservatives to work on this kind of thing. So, you know, I think broadly, I don't see that many places where our parties are coming back together in the United States. It seems like we're finding all kinds of places to to, to drive wedges further apart. I think that's actually different on climate and clean energy. I think the parties are gradually, lurchingly heading back towards the center. Uh, and, uh, you know, that gives me hope about this issue. That gives me hope broadly about the rest of uh, the rest of the country and the rest of the, you know, all the other issues. But I don't work on anything else. I just work on this all the time. So um, unlike all of you who live in the real world that actually think about lots of different things, I'm just, I just get to, you know, drive entirely deeply on this. I, I think a lot of us are, share that quality, actually. Okay, we do right, this okay, one right, thing. Yeah. <laughs> taking care of our families, which you also do. Uh, I, I, I did think at the end of the uh, my time in Egypt uh, that, I, that looking at the folks in the room, at the members of Congress, they reminded me a little bit of our volunteers after they'd been to the Hill, you know, mm. you know and discovered that they had a voice and they could talk to people and, and that a dialogue was possible. And, and that, was, that was the way it felt to me a little bit in the room at that dinner at the end. Um, so I hope I'm right. Um, and I hope that uh, you get even more folks there next year. I hope so. Well, we grew from four members to six members. From, so I'll call that a 50% increase. And you don't have to grow that, you know, 50% that many years in a row until we have everybody. Yeah. Yep. If that was our growth trajectory too, only we were like, we went from two <laughs> and to four, we doubled. <laughs> <laughs> And I do, I just want to say, you know, again, uh, uh, you know, uh, Madeline and to the entire team um, that it, it was really affirming to have you all there with us um, uh, in Egypt, to, to have you in partnership uh, with the Conservative Climate Foundation and to have your, you know, your entire network and base uh, out there uh, working on these issues. It's, uh, uh, it's really affirming to us, to our team, to our mission that, uh, that there are other folks that are really passionate about finding a way forward on this and a bipartisan way forward on this. Yeah, uh, that is what we're about. And I'm very glad to be doing that. Yeah, I, I also have to say, as we wind up here, um, there's been comments in the chat about uh, the, the vast nerdiness of you. I'll just say they phrased it nicely. <laughs> <laughs> Do I take that I as a compliment think, or do I, I take that as, have, is that a, is that a compliment or a damning blow? It's a compliment. It's okay, a compliment. Okay, this, okay. Is a, this is an organization with a great many very nerdy people. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you are up there with the nerdiest of them. And, uh, and I think that was something people very much appreciated. Right. Thank you so much, Rich. Okay, thank you. Okay, have a great afternoon. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.